Hey, this is Dan. Good, Alex. I'm going live on a Facebook stream here in five minutes. Um, can we uh, exchange emails about this? Okay, how do you, uh, do we want to do that right now? It, yeah, 3 p.m. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. Okay, thanks. Bye. All right, testing, 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 testing. I think I may be the only one in here. Are you on the thing? I am. Can you see me? I can see you. Can you hear me? Am I broadcasting uh, sound? Well, can you hear me from the other room or can you hear me through the speakers? Both. So is it, um, is it synchronizing with my picture? Let me close the door. Yes, uh, close the door or yes, it's synchronizing with the picture? Yes, it's synchronizing with the picture. So the picture is a little delayed. It's just a little delayed. Everything's a little delayed. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Thanks, Christine. Appreciate your feedback. We've got a couple minutes to go here before the top of the hour. So I just wanted to get this started and make sure that I'm, I'm uh, coming through. And I am. So that's great. Even though you can't see me, I'm, I should still be coming through on the sound. All right. Let me see if this is going to work like that. Okay, good. I love it when things work. Okay, should be unmuted again. Now you're on. 
Okay, Christina should be on again. Uh, I did mute on purpose, but uh, we got one. Oh, it's 11 o'clock. All right. So I have just a quick, um, some slides to go through and then we're gonna do some q and A. I received a bunch of questions uh, previously, so we're gonna go through those and uh, any questions that you have. Um, Christine, I see you found the, uh, the chat function. Um, there should be a chat function. If you haven't found it, you can look around on the, the, um, the Facebook stream. I really, sorry, I'm, I'm not a good advisor on this because I don't know how the Facebook stream works, just the back end. So I'm gonna bring in my face again. So, um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Dan Kraus. I am an estate planning and elder law attorney, and I practice in Wisconsin. I'm also licensed in Illinois and Minnesota. What we're talking about today is mainly having to do with general principles of estate planning, although any specifics uh, are going to apply to Wisconsin, may apply to other states, but I can't advise you on that because I don't uh, really practice in other states besides Wisconsin. So uh, as they say, your mileage may vary, but general principles are pretty much the same in all states. Uh, you should check with uh, your own attorney though, if you have a question about whether something applies to you or whether it's a good idea for you to do. Um, just a, a CYA, I'm not giving anybody specific legal advice today. It's just in general uh, for educational purposes only. We're going to talk about estate planning basics, nursing planning, VA pension planning. So um, now I'm going to go to the next slide. Just a little bit about me. Uh, I've been an attorney for 23, 24 years now since the turn of the century, as they say. Um, I'm uh, a retired Army JAG officer. Uh, I spent 21 years in the military, uh, mostly reserves, but four years of active duty uh, during the 9-11, post-9-11 uh, stuff that went on. Let's see, I wrote a book. Uh, I'm certified. I'm one of the few certified estate planning law specialists in Wisconsin. I think there are seven of us now, maybe eight. I'm licensed in Wisconsin, Illinois, and Minnesota. And um, I was in the Peace Corps for a couple of years. Okay. Here's some, you know, brags about the firm uh, and some brags about me. We're we're highly rated and got a lot of good um, uh, feedback from the Better Business Bureau, Google, etc. All right, we're going to talk about wills, financial powers of attorney, health care powers of attorney, trusts, revocable and irrevocable. And we're just going to hit these at a really high level. So um, it's going to leave a lot of room for questions and answers. Um, estate taxes, nursing expense planning, and VA pension sometimes known as aid in attendance. That's a non-service connected VA pension uh, planning for uh, veterans and their surviving spouses. Okay, next slide. All right, so the minimum that you need, that anybody needs to have, what I would consider a comprehensive estate plan is to have a will in case you pass away or for when you pass away, Financial power of attorney for managing assets while you are alive but unable to manage them for yourself if that ever happens to you. And a health care power of attorney to manage your health care if you are unable to manage that by yourself. Those three things uh, constitute a comprehensive estate plan. Now the estate plans that we do have all of those things but they also have uh, other parts. So let's talk about wills. Um, first of all, if you don't plan, if you don't have a will, if you don't have a trust, if you don't have something that's going to uh, tell where your stuff is going to go, 
then certain things may will or may happen. Um, some of those things might be bad. So let's talk about what those are. The state law controls. So where is your stuff going to go? I can't tell you unless I know more about your family. But if you die without a will, the state law will say who gets what. Uh, in general, your closest relatives are going to get your stuff, but which ones and in how much um, depends on your state and depends on which relatives you have that are living. Uh, if, with a will, you're going to have probate proceedings in court. Uh, if, or even without a will, without a will, you're going to have probate proceedings. With a will, you also have proceed, uh, probate proceedings. But if you don't plan and young people are going to receive assets from you. That means that you can't hold it from them past the age of 18. Uh, if you plan with a will or a trust, you can have those things held until a child reaches a more reasonable age, say 25 or sometimes um, higher than that. Um, if you don't plan in a second marriage situation, the surviving spouse may get left out in the cold or the kids get left out in the cold or nobody's happy because uh, each of them get a little, but nobody gets as much as they think they should deserve and probably not what you would want. Um, so intestacy is meaning you die without a testament. So intestacy is dying without a last will and testament. This is an old example, but it's a famous example. James Dean was a movie actor in the 1950s and early 60s, and he died at an early age, 24. Um, died without a will. It's not surprising, not very many 24-year-olds have a will, unfortunately, but his entire estate, including his licensing fees, passed to his father. His mother had died when he was young. However, his father had abandoned him as a child, so when his mother died, his father just passed him off to his mother's sister and then didn't really have much to do with him for the rest of his life. They had a bad relationship, and it's probably um, a certainty that James Dean would not have wanted his father to have his estate when he died. However, without planning, there was nothing he could do. It was automatic. And uh, the father, I think, may have just recently died, um, but he was getting lots of money throughout his life because of... Um, his son did not plan his estate. So wills, there are pitfalls to doing will as well. Court involvement, will uh, makes a court uh, have to be involved because a will is, is really only a nomination. It's not an official document until the court uh, approves it, gives a stamp of approval, and then it becomes uh, the law of the land, so to say, as far as your, your assets go. Probates, um, because of court involvement, that's a probate case, and they can be lengthy. Um, several years ago, I know uh, Dane County probates were averaging about 13 months. I think that's probably longer now. The, the major issue is taxes. Uh, to get the taxes done, sometimes you have to wait a whole year before you can file the taxes. Um, you don't have any privacy for the loved ones. Everything goes through the court. So the court is a public uh, forum. Anything that gets filed with the court is public access and um, nosy neighbors can go in and see what you had when you died uh, and see who gets all of your stuff and then they can maybe target them for um, fraud or get rich quick schemes. So that's the inviting of predators. Um, because you have a public uh, forum where all of your laundry gets aired out. Um, everybody knows how much you had, uh, how much your kids are getting, and how vulnerable they might be to um, to uh, people, say, gold diggers. All right, powers of attorney, financial and health care. So financial power of attorney, well, if you don't plan, then once again, the state law controls. If you become incapacitated and you have assets and your bills need to be paid and your taxes need to be paid, etc., and nobody has a power of attorney for you, then there needs to be a guardianship. Guardians 
have to be appointed. And the $6,000 uh, figure there is just an estimate of a low estimate as how much it's going to cost you in order to get a guardian appointed over your estate. Um, considering the attorneys, the guardian ad litem has to be paid, all of this. The court then supervises your life. Your family no longer has uh, full control to make decisions. They would have to ask the court for permission. And many of the things that people would want to do, um, the court will not allow you to do. One example is if a person needs, say, Medicaid to pay for long-term care uh, in a nursing home because the nursing home costs $13,000 a month, um, the family might want to try to give away some of your assets to save them from having to be spent and so they could be used by your family instead of uh, the nursing home. It, this is not possible in a guardianship situation. Family is not, will not be allowed to do that to try to save your assets. All right, so unintended consequences. You might get a guardian you don't want. In fact, just today I got a uh, letter in the mail from a, uh, a corporate guardian that said, we want to be your friend. Uh, if you have a guardianship where nobody wants to be a guardian, we would love to be the guardian there. The corporate guardian gets paid from the money that uh, belonged, or the money or the assets that belong to the person who needs the guardian. Um, they do a great service. I'm not trying to say corporate guardians are bad. It's just that you don't know them. They don't know your family. They don't know you. Um, and going into court to be proven that you're incapacitated can be embarrassing and it's expensive. So while you're alive, the tools that you should use for planning if, in case you become incompetent are a power of attorney for finances and a health care power of attorney. You can also use a living will, which is a pull the plug document. It authorizes uh, doctors and nurses to stop treatment in certain cases. Um, you can also use trust. Trust can help you plan during your lifetime. If you become incapacitated and you have assets in a trust, the um, loved ones can manage those assets for you. So trusts are become on many, trusts come in many, many shapes and sizes and colors and, and purposes. There's revocable trusts. Um, those are typically used as a will substitute. They can avoid probate because a trust does not die, so a trust doesn't have to go through probate. If you put your assets in a trust after you die, your trust can, or your trustee can manage all of your assets and give them to who you want to give them to without ever making a public declaration, uh, filing anything in court, or um, putting a notice in the paper. It's all very private. So you can preserve your privacy with a revocable trust as compared to a will. It's controlled by you. You can change it, modify it. Um, you can use the assets that you put in the trust for any purpose that you want to. And it's really uh, kind of a set and forget it. You don't really have to remind yourself daily that you have a trust. It's, your life just goes on like it always did. With irrevocable trusts, there's a lot of kinds of irrevocable trusts. Um, mostly they're used for either tax planning or asset protection. Um, the asset protection uh, is against nursing costs or lawsuits, taxes, um, etc. We're going to talk a little bit about the estate tax. Very little because right now the, uh, the federal estate tax exemption is $12.92 million. So anybody that dies in 2023, if they have less than $12.92 million, um, including insurance and uh, IRAs, etc. If you have below that, there's no estate tax. Wisconsin has no estate tax. It used to have an estate tax, but Wisconsin does not. Many states do. So um, depending on your state, you may have a state estate tax if your, if your um, net worth is below 12.92 million, but it depends on the state. <clears throat> Uh, in 2026, the estate tax exemption is scheduled to go back down. We don't know what the number is going to be, but it should be around $7 million. Uh, it is $5 million in 2012 indexed 
for inflation. So we figure by 2026, it should be about $7 million, but we'll have to see when 2026 rolls around. Nursing home expense planning, another big issue in estate planning that a lot of people are concerned with. In fact, this estate tax used to be the big boogeyman, but right now it's uh, losing everything at the end of life because of nursing costs. So we're gonna um, breeze through this. In fact, I'm just gonna quickly go through this. There's a lot of issues with getting qualified for Medicaid. Medicaid is the, is the program that will pay for nursing costs, but only if you've planned properly or if you cannot afford it. Most people go through the process of spend down, which means in the end they have nothing left to give their kids. And in fact, they have nothing left to uh, provide for their support during the end of their life. Once they've spent it all, they really are reliant 100% on um, Medicaid. Veterans pensions also can um, help people to to pay for home-based care or they can pay their family for care. It's not the same as Medicaid. It will, will not pay for all of your care, but there are certain amounts that you can, you can get. If you are an unmarried vet, you can get up to $2,229 a month. Um, you can get up to $2,642 a month if you're married. So if you're the veteran and you need care and you have dependents, um, you can get that much. A surviving spouse can get a little more than half of that, um, but there are qualifications. You have to have served on active duty during a wartime period that are defined in the laws. Okay. Now, let's see. Your asset, in order to qualify for this, your assets, all of your countable assets plus your annual income have to be under $150,538. So your home plus two connected acres is not included in that um, calculation. If you're going to give away assets in order to get down to that amount, the uh, VA has a three year look back period. These are just maximum benefits. Let's get to a uh, question and answer. Okay, so that's just some basics. Um, not uh, wanting to, to dwell on that. Um, and get to the meat of today's presentation. So we had a question. How do you convince your mother she does in fact need a will? <laughs> Well, that is a, that's a, the $64,000 question. How do you convince somebody that they need a will? You generally, you don't. Um, there's so much information out there about the, you know, the, the dangers of not having a will. Um, once you are in old age and you're not married anymore, you might be widowed, you might be divorced, but not looking to marry again, and you want everything to go to your kids, um, the, uh, the urgency to get a will may not be as great. You're not really worried about things like that. But to do estate planning, you should have those three, the three basic things, the will, the power of attorney, and the healthcare power of attorney. They all work together to make sure that whatever your wishes are uh, gets done and whoever you want to be in control is in control. Now, how to convince your mother that she might need a will is to ask her who she would want to be in control of her assets after she passes away and if there's anybody that she really doesn't want to be in control of the assets. Because I find that when people don't plan, sometimes it's the person that they would never want to be in charge who brings themselves forward and then takes control. So that might be one way if you want to talk to your mother about making sure the person that she wants to be in charge is in charge and the person who she may not trust as much or, or might cause, um, say, um, 
waves or, or problems in the family that they don't get in charge of the estate uh, after, after your mother is gone. So there's a, another question. I have no children or siblings. My parents are deceased. Who gets my money if I don't have a will? I've heard the state takes it. Well, it's possible. It's possible that this, the state might take it. All right. So it's possible that the state may take the assets. But in Wisconsin, here's the rules. All right. So if you're not married, you don't have kids, uh, you don't have parents, okay? So depending on these three things, then everything goes down the line from your parents. So um, you don't have siblings. Uh, if you have siblings who have died, that makes a difference because the nieces and nephews of your dead siblings then would inherit. If you had no siblings at all, so there's no nieces and nephews, then the state law, Wisconsin state law, says you go up one more level. So you got two sets of grandparents. Now, they're probably also passed away, but then you look for aunts and uncles, then uh, second cousins, and down the line from there. So any descendants of your grandparents then would be considered uh, your heir. So you start at the grandparents and then you use a formula that says um, they would get everything and if they're both passed away then their children would get everything. So your aunts and uncles would get everything in equal uh, shares. If any of them had passed away then their share that for that person would go down the line to their children which would be uh, your cousins or your second cousins. Um, no, I'm sorry, I keep saying second cousins, but what I meant to say was first cousins. Second cousins are not included in Wisconsin as far as, as intestate inheritance, only first cousins. So descendants of your aunts and uncles, um, first cousins, their kids, first cousins once removed, their kids, first cousins twice removed. So any person that's deceased in that family tree, their children receive equally what they would have gotten. All right, that's, that's what happens. Now, if you have nobody that's a descendant of your grandparents living, then in Wisconsin, it goes to the state. Uh, in fact, it goes to the general education fund in the state. And um, interestingly, every year, a couple of, of estates end up paying out to the um, state general education fund because no, there are no people who are uh, descendants of the deceased person's grandparent, and that person didn't do a will or any kind of planning. All right, another question. Can my ex-wife inherit anything if I have not upgraded my, updated my will? Luckily, and I can't remember the, um, the statute number, but luckily Wisconsin, and I think most states, have automatic um, bylaw it ejects the spouse upon divorce. And in fact, Wisconsin also ejects all the spouse's relatives. So that would not include people who are also related to you, the pe but just the people that are related to your spouse and not to you. So your spouse's parents, uh, if your spouse had children that aren't yours, your spouse's kids, they would all be excluded from your will once the divorce is final. And that's a key. Now, if you're in the process of divorce, none of that takes effect. So if you die while you're in the process of divorce, unfortunately, then your spouse would inherit everything or um, it would go according to the state law if you had no plan. So also just a, another note, if you named your spouse as the power of attorney under your power of attorney, that's also wiped out at the divorce. So. Rest easy if you haven't changed your estate planning documents. Don't, I'm not saying delay, but you don't have to rush out the day you get divorced and change everything. It is actually a pretty good idea to change everything before you get divorced, though once, once you're in the process of divorce and you know what's happening, you should change things because if something happens to you during a pendency of a divorce, 
like I say, your spouse is still your uh, beneficiary. All right, question. In a will, is it important to say who is excluded? Can I just say who is included? Um, that's a great question. So many people do not um, like to disinherit people specifically because it might hurt their feelings. However, disinheritance, specifically saying that they don't get anything is the best way to make sure that they don't get anything. However, just by, by saying certain people get it, it will exclude those other people from getting it unless they have some sort of an argument like it, that they are your child that you didn't know about, then they may be able to have some sort of a, um, a claim in your estate. But usually just the people that you name are going to get anything. Now, if all of those people that you name died, then it may just go according to intestate if you haven't provided for anybody to get it in that case. So in that case, the people that you don't want to get it may get it, even though you didn't name them, um, because all the other people or some of the other people that you named had died or just denounced the inheritance and didn't want it. All right, uh, question, if I leave everything to my wife, can she then give it to all her children instead of mine? The answer is yes. Once you die and your estate is settled, and something goes to somebody and they put it in their bank account, they can do whatever they want with it. In order for you to protect from uh, that your children are going to get something, there are different ways to do that, but um, none of them are perfect. Uh, things happen after um, somebody dies. Spouses can get remarried. Spouses can change their mind about your kids, and we see these things happen all the time, so that the first spouse to die, their children end up getting nothing. It happens so often. We offer a contract that's enforceable after death that the spouse agrees, and it can be, like I say, enforced against them. They agree that they will not change the beneficiaries after one spouse dies. Uh, it's a big promise, um, but it is an enforceable contract. You can also split your estate on your death and say your spouse doesn't get everything, they only get part of it. And maybe they can uh, have access to the other part, but then they have to ask permission from your, your children or maybe a third party that they can get access to what's gonna eventually go to your kids after your spouse dies. There's different ways to plan for that, but in the general case, if you just give everything to your spouse, they can, and oftentimes they will, forget about your kids and give everything to their kids. All right, another question. What's the best way to plan for disposable, uh, disposal of your house, household goods and equipment, and cars if you die suddenly? The kids live in another state and don't want to live in the house in Wisconsin. What's the best way to plan? Well, in that case, the best way to plan is in a revocable living trust that you can name a trustee to take over for you so that they don't have to go into a probate case. They don't have to ask the court to be able to sell the house. The trustee just steps in, sells the house, and then delivers the money uh, to the kids after all the expenses and taxes are paid. Um, that's the most efficient way to do that stuff. If you have somebody close by that can take um, take charge of that. If you don't want to have your kids have to get involved, you can appoint a trustee or a personal representative under a will who is a bank or a bank trust company. Uh, not every bank has a trust department who could act as a personal representative or a trustee, but um, there are also um, just standalone trust companies that are not banks. So there are options for naming a corporate trustee or an institutional trustee, as they say, that can take care of everything and you don't have to worry about your kids fighting over who's gonna be in charge or the fact that your kids are gonna to have to travel to Wisconsin in order to um, get everything cleaned up, etc. A trustee can be put in charge of that. And of course, they get paid for their services. 
Let's see. Another question. Why is a trust so expensive? Now, that's a, that's a good question. Why is a trust so expensive? It is um, expensive because it takes a lot of expertise to know what to do when you're creating a trust. It's more expensive than a will package because there's a lot more documents involved, but there's also a lot more follow-up. There's, there's instructions for keeping things in your trust so that with a will, you don't have to do what we call funding or asset alignment. You don't have to take your bank accounts and put them in the trust. You don't have to be advised that that needs to be done. Um, there's uh, certain things that do need to be done with the trust that don't need to be done with a will. Um, you're paying a lot of times. I mean, you can you can find less expensive and more expensive. Typically, with the more expensive, you're going to get better service. Uh, you're going to go to an attorney's office. You're going to deal with an attorney who um, asks about your asset situation, about your family situation, and is going to guide you in the right provisions to put in your trust. Then there's the other side of the coin where there's forms that you can get online. You can buy them uh, online sometimes for five, six hundred bucks, fill them out yourself, and then you sign them. But um, nobody is there really to guide you in your personal um, situation as to whether this is smart or this is not. Um, you don't know whether it's going to cover you. Um, in the end, when it's necessary to cover you, you don't know whether it's going to protect against um, health care costs, um, things like that. Why is it so expensive? Expertise, um, employee time. Uh, things like that. Let's see. Another question. Is there a reason for young people to do planning? College age. Uh, the answer is yes. There's a big reason for young people to do planning because once you're 18 in Wisconsin, your parents will no longer have the ability to make health care decisions for you. <clears throat> your parents will no longer have the ability to reach into your bank account and do things for you. And that's because you're an adult. You can um, cut your parents off. You, um, they are now legally uh, strangers as far as making legal decisions for you. So that once you're 18, if you go off to college and God forbid something happens to you, a car accident, a bad illness, something you're at Lenda in the hospital, or you're not able to make decisions for yourself, for a time or you become incapacitated or uh, go into a vegetative state. These are terrible things that can happen, but it's better if the parents have been given legal documentation so that they can now make decisions regarding the health care and the finances. So once a person reaches 18 years of age, they should have a health care power of attorney and a financial power of attorney. A will is also a great idea because that makes a comprehensive estate plan, but for a young person who may not have any assets and really uh, they're not married, they don't have any kids, they, as long as they want everything to go to their parents, a will may not be as important as the other two, but those other two, so important in case something happens to the young person. The parents um, do not want to have to go through the guardianship process in order to gain control of the child's um, health care and their assets. All right. The last question that I have is, um, why is a HIPAA privacy document necessary if I have a POA for health care? Well, a HIPAA privacy document is a document that's effective immediately. So that means that the people that you name on that HIPAA privacy document can access your health care before you've been uh, declared to be incompetent. So they don't have to wait for doctors to activate a health care power of attorney. Also, on a HIPAA uh, release, you can put all of your kids on there so that all of them have access to your health care information or they can call the hospital and ask about your condition, etc. Uh, not just the one. Because in a health care power of attorney, it's just one person that's going to be in charge. 
normally. You can put two or more, but I don't recommend that. So it's only the one person that's going to have that access. If you want more than one person to have the ability to um, ask questions of your doctor, to look at your medical records, to um, not to make decisions about you, but just to find out information about your health care. If you want more than one person, then you need that HIPAA document. Now, just as an aside, a downside to the HIPAA uh, release is they're not always enforceable. So the healthcare um, agency or the clinic or the hospital can refuse to accept a general HIPAA authorization. We provide them for our clients, but just they know that they're usually accepted, but they aren't always. We've come across just one time when our HIPAA authorization was not um, allowed by a healthcare facility, and that was a mental health care facility. So um, in this case, it was UW Mental Health Center um, would not release um, information about a person who uh, was a spouse that was in the facility without a specific release uh, for that facility. They, they insisted that be on their form and that it's signed on their form. So um, HIPAA releases are useful. They're good for many things, but they're not always effective. So just know that there's really not a lot you can do about that. But in the, the back up there is just as the question asker had said, is then you're just stuck with the healthcare power of attorney having access and not, not anyone else. All right. That is the end of my questions that I have. Um, does anyone have any further questions? Um, I think the only way to ask questions is to write in the comments. So I don't know of any way that a person can raise their hand or speak up. I think I'm the only one that can talk in this, uh, this particular format. All right. I'm going to give a couple more uh, seconds here and then we'll just close down this um, this session let's see um, if you do have a question please post it in the comments um, I'm happy to answer anything we've got some time left Okay. Oh, that's not a question. It was a thank you. Well, you're certainly welcome. I'm happy to, to provide any information that I can. Um, where can you learn more about our law firm? Yes, I didn't say this. Uh, you can find us at friendly.law. So you can go to the internet and you just type in friendly.law. A lot of person, a lot of people put friendlylaw.com. It's not that. It's friendly.law. Um, there's a lot of ways to get to our website. Of course, you can just Google Krause Estate Planning, but if you want to go directly to the website, you can just type in friendly.law. You can also type in estateplanningpeople.com. Um, all one word, obviously, estateplanningpeople.com. Um, so that's how you can learn more about us. You can also give us a call. Uh, operators are standing by. Uh, the, the phone number, um, we use our uh, Madison number because it's top of my head. It's 608-268-5751. Uh, um, talk to our receptionist and she will get you to the right person. Oh, and Laura has posted the number there. Um, as well. All right, so my uh, I'm starting to get a little hoarse um, from talking so much, but I do appreciate you um, coming and watching and listening and learning. And if you do have any further questions, just you know, give us a call. Uh, go to the website. There's a there's a place to contact us. There you can contact us in many different ways. Um, but telepathy 
uh, so far hasn't worked. All right. Take care, everyone. Thanks for joining us, and have a great day and a wonderful fall. Now I have to figure out how to stop. All right, there we go. Bye.